All right, hello everybody. We apologize for the delay. We we're having some technical issues with screen sharing. Um, but while we are waiting for people to join um, the, the Zoom room, if you all want to type in chat, what is your favorite flower? Because we're going to get to talk about bees and their favorite flowers today, which should be a lot of fun. All right, so if you have a favorite flower, please feel free to type in chat. Um, and again, we apologize for the delays. We we're having some technical difficulties with screen sharing. So, all right. So my name is Sam and I'll be your host for today. And we're going to get to talk about bees and the flowers that they love with Dr. Nancy Lee Adamson. But first I have a quick tutorial for those of you joining us on Zoom. Should look very familiar. Um, but again, in Zoom, when you're looking, you should have options uh, for your privacy. We're not allowing people to unmute and we're not allowing people to turn on their video in this um, call. Call. But uh, one thing that you can do is turn on captions. So in the bottom, there is the option to turn on closed captions. Just click on that and then you click show subtitle and then you can change your subtitle settings on um, subtitle settings to make them larger or smaller if needed. The other thing, if you would like to view um, Dr. Adamson's video um, next to the uh, slides, if you uh, change it to speaker view so that we can just see um, your video, and then you can click side by side mode in that view options mode. Um, and then you can make the presentation larger or smaller if needed um, using that slider bar there. And as always, uh, if you're joining us via Zoom or via YouTube, please feel free to comment and make cool observations in the chat as well as ask questions. We'll be looking at both of those chats, but please remember to be a good digital citizen and have respect for both the presenter as well as your fellow attendees and make sure that the chat and um, questions and things like that are on topic for what we are talking about. Um, and this program is recorded on Zoom, so um, as well as being on YouTube. So it'll be on our YouTube um, immediately after this if you want to come back and learn more about the bees and the flowers that they love. All right, so with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Adamson, who's going to get to talk about those bees and flowers. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sam. and. Uh, for hosting, for to Susan for moderating, Carrie for coordinating, Hugo for um, his technical assistance, and all the NC Museum of Natural Sciences staff and volunteers for making Bugfest such an extraordinary and wonderful event every year. Um, so before I begin the program, I gratefully acknowledge the Sisipaha, Eno, Sapani, and Shikori native peoples from whose ancestral homelands I'm sharing this program today in Summerfield near Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, next slide. <laughs> Someone's helping me move the slides ahead so there might be a little delay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much to all of you for caring for the little things that run the world. I first did this program for um, Denise Ellsworth's Ohio Bee Atlas um, class of volunteers that are um, helping to monitor there and then for Xerxes Bee Cities program. And um, so additional links are posted that include copies of um, some of those resources. So I hope this program, oh, could you advance please? Thank you. I hope this program will do three things, inspire you to learn more about the specialist bees and host plants in your communities, to plant or protect those species, and to start sharing your sightings on iNaturalist Bug Guide, and other community science sites like Bumblebee Watch, Queen, and Nest Watch. So as I mentioned, um, a PDF copy of the presentation and additional, additional resources with live links is posted at tinyurl.com forward slash specialist bees. And uh, the museum folks are also posting all the links in the chat and I believe below the uh, program on YouTube as well. So thanks so much. And uh, next slide. Many native bees are pollen specialists, and that means they collect pollen from only one species, genus, or family. They may collect nectar from many different plants. So oligolig oh, or mesolig bees collect pollen from one plant family 
or a few related genera or species, and mon monoleague bees collect pollen from a single species or genus. Next slide, please. So these bees have evolved with their host plants. Specializing makes foraging more efficient. Specialists can digest their host pollen better than others and may be more effective pollinators. But if something happens to the plants or climate affects emergence times of the bees and plants differently, then both groups may suffer. One may have no food and the other may have no pollinators. Other advantages relate to finding mates. Uh, for bees, some bees find their mates at flowers. Some bees collect oils and resins from host plants that help attract their mates. Next slide, please. Jared Fowler and Sam Drogi posted all the data they could find on specialist bees of the eastern U.S. on this site. Jared has added similar sites for the central and western U.S. Uh, toward the bottom of the page, you'll find recommendations regarding conservation. They found that 60% of pollen specialists are rare. So that's why we're, I'm really hoping you'll be inspired to plant uh, plants that you see um, in this program or visit sites that have the plants and, and help protect them in uh, the wild as well. Next slide, please. So on the site, you'll find bee family, genus, species, which states they've been found in, their conservation status, phenology. That means when you can expect to see adult bees out and about. That's the sort of January through December um, uh, list there. And host plant info. So the circled um, items um, illustrate how sometimes the species name relates to its host plant. So in this case, it's Andrina arabis, and then the plant is the same. Next slide, please. So when you click on that B, it'll take you to discover life. And that has a whole bunch of information about bees. Um, and then if you click on the plant name, it actually takes you to the USDA plants database. And um, next slide, please. You can zoom in on the plants maps for county distribution at the genus or species level or you can see all the species in that genus by clicking on subordinate taxa. These maps have the same info you'll find on the Biota of North America plant atlas at bonap.net. Next slide, please. If you want to observe or plant for pollinators, find your inspiration on this site, Host Plants for Pollen Specialists. So it's linked to from the first site that we saw and then this that um, this links back to that site as well. So um, Jared includes all the plants for which he could find documentation, but that doesn't mean other species in that family or genus are not host plants. So this is where you come in. Documenting visits will help us understand uh, more connections. And I just want to emphasize, um, next slide, that um, the uh, sightings that um, individual people make really make a, a really big difference because most most states just have a single zoologist monitoring all animals in the state and so having people take photos of insects and um, other wildlife is extremely helpful. So on the host plant page Fowler lists the species not just genera and then if you scroll down you'll find recommendations. He highlights species that aren't read readily available and encourages propagation of these, many of which are annuals, biennials, or obligate wetland or upland species. Next slide, please. I like to share this pipevine swallowtail pupation example to illustrate how your documentation of wildlife encounters might help improve our understanding of habitat needs. We know a lot about pipevine swallowtail butterflies, caterpillar, um, host plants, and we think as long as we know the caterpillar um, has its host, it should be fine. But um, when I see this pipevine swallowtail caterpillar um, on the yellow birch, I wonder how important is its uh, overwintering site to its survival. So we know it needs Dutchman's pipe 
um, as a caterpillar, but it's hard to imagine it blending in quite as well um, as it does on yellow birch. So when you start documenting things on, on iNaturalist, that kind of builds this enormous data set where we can start to understand even more relationships than we currently do. Next slide, please. So in case you're not familiar with iNaturalist, you can help document specialist bees by photographing insects on host plants and posting to iNaturalist or bug guide. And um, I'll be talking about these in a little more detail later. Um, but in case you're not familiar, you can post photos from your phone with or without an identification and others will verify or identify what you post. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to take a closer look at the host plant families that Fowler and Jogi list on the Specialist Bee website. You may already have many of these in your yards or communities or nearby natural areas or want to plan visits so you can observe the Specialist Bees. And so one of the things um, that I kind of went over very quickly was on the Specialist Bee page, it shows the phenology. So it shows when those bees are active. So if you're interested in a particular bee, you can kind of look and go see um, what dates it might be active and then find those plants. And um, so next slide, please. By focusing on the plants, I'm hoping to inspire you to find or plant bees. Slides include the family and genera or genus Fowler and Jogi list. Sometimes I, I include the species that's found in our region. So I'm going to skim through these slides and just highlight some key concepts. Remember the program is going to be available on YouTube where you can pause anytime you like and you can access a PDF copy at the tiny URL and we'll show that uh, site again later. Zizia and Golden Alexanders is a wonderful early spring blooming wildflower that is also one of the few native parsley family plants you can find in nurseries. Many butterfly lovers look for parsley plant family plants because they are also the host plant for black swallowtail uh, butterfly caterpillars. Next slide, please. Since I'll be going through the plant family slides quickly, I want to highlight some of the terrific plant resources available regionally and nationally. In North Carolina, the North Carolina Pollinator Conservation Alliance, North Carolina Native Plant Society, North Carolina Botanical Garden and the pollinator, the pollinator Paradise Garden that Debbie Roos has created in Pittsburgh and the NC Audubon um, all have excellent resources about native plants that support pollinators. Xerces Society, which is an international organization, has a, lots of different plant lists, some for pollinators generally and others targeting monarchs. Many Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA affiliates, and we have a ton in North Carolina, have developed lists of pollinator plants that also include local nursery sources for these plants. Next slide, please. So hollies are excellent plants for lots of wildlife, providing nectar and pollen for diverse insects in spring and nutritious berries for birds and other animals from fall to early spring. Next slide. The aster family is huge with more than 150 genera in North Carolina and about 2000 species. I've tried to include some of the genera listed as hosts. Our native thistles are not invasive and are very important for many other animals, including goldfinches. Annual sunflowers are native farther west, but we have lots of wonderful perennial sunflowers, including sunchokes, which is also called Jerusalem artichoke and has a delicious edible tuber. Next slide, please. Aster specialists are often called sunflower bees. Some have these really pronounced pollen carrying hairs on their hind legs that look like chaps. All male bees have one extra antennal segment, 13 versus the females, 12. Bees use their antennae like noses and males need extra sensory power to locate females from their scents or their pheromones. Many of the sunflower bee males have extra long antennae and are called longhorn bees. Next slide, please. So these are just three really common and easy to grow uh, native uh, 
plants in the sunflower aster family, Coreopsis, aster, and Helen's flower. Next slide, please. Okay, now this carpenter bee, it is, uh, this is a carpenter bee mimic leaf cutter. <laughs> How's that for a mouthful? Um, so it's a specialist that you can recognize the species in the field. And it's also what's called dimorphic. So the females look different from the males. The females are all black um, and they have pollen carrying hairs on their abdomen. So it, it's a really distinctive, unique look. And then the males have a lot more white hairs and they have especially hairy front uh, forelegs. And they actually use these to cover the female's eyes while they mate. And um, so another thing on this slide, I wanted to remind you that bee specialists are pollen specialists. So that means they um, just collect pollen from one type of flower, but they may collect nectar from lots of things. In this case, a mountain mint and um, milkweed. So when we were doing a run through of this program, Carrie asked about solitary bee nesting habits. In general, all the bees that carry pollen on their abdomens, like this leaf cutter bee, and then mason bees, like blue orchard bees that a lot of people are familiar with, they all nest in cavities. Um, and we can provide uh, nesting habitat for them by putting out bamboo or drilled wood. And then most bees, the other 70%, nest in the ground. So next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite plants, tall bellflower. And it's one that you, you don't really see much in the nursery trade, but it's very easy to grow from seed. And um, if you just get out into uh, natural areas, it's actually relatively common. OK, next slide. We have some wonderful native morning glories that are not at all weedy like introduced field bindweed. They are flowering now early in the day and then they'll close up um, you know, in the afternoon. A wonderful Native American botanist from New York, Robin Wall Kimmerer, mentions that plants with a lot of common names are usually very important culturally. If I ever am able to cultivate this plant at home, I want to learn more about how to harvest and cook it since it's common names wild sweet potato, wild potato vine, and wild rhubarb suggest that the leaves and tuber are both edible. Okay, next slide. Shrub dogwoods are beautiful and easy to grow spring blooming shrubs that also produce berries eaten by lots of other wildlife in winter. So a lot of times we just think of the flowering dogwood um, and um, that's now actually in a different genus um, and um, as far as I know, the specialists are just associated with this, uh, um, the shrub dogwoods, which are now in the Sweda genus that used to be cornus. Okay, next slide. If you grow squash or pumpkin, you'll likely find squash bees in the flowers or see the males darting from flower to flower. Though they are similar in size and coloration to honeybees, it's easy to recognize both male and female once you take a closer look. The males have longer antennae and a little yellow patch on their nose. Next slide, please. We have a wonderful diversity of native blueberries and huckleberries. In very early spring, if you see a bee that looks like a bumblebee, but is much smaller than a queen, which are the only bees, only bumblebees that are out very early in spring, if it has a white patch on its face, chances are it's a male southeastern blueberry bee. Later in the season, there are other bees that look similar, but at that time of year, the um, ones with the white patch are, are generally the southeastern blueberry. Okay, next slide. Sparkleberry is um, in the, the family used by the southeastern blueberry bee, and it's one of those gorgeous native shrubs that is not that easy to find in nurseries, but deserves uh, attention. Okay, next slide. Our diverse native legumes also deserve more attention and many are very drought tolerant. This pink fuzzy bean on the right, for example, is a vine that grows beautifully in a hanging basket. And um, we have many of the leaf cutter bees that are specialists on the, 
on the uh, legume family. Alrighty, next slide please. So when I visit natural areas with wild geranium in the late afternoon, I often find males, male bees sleeping in the flowers that I assume are the specialist and Gina distant, um, a kind of mining bee. The females nest in the ground, but the males sometimes make flowers their home since they don't have a nest to go to. Next slide, please. I ended up including these two native phacelias that are annual species, but the genus Hydrophyllum um, includes Virginia waterleaf, a beautiful perennial that will grow fine in a large container, as does this annual fern leaf phacelia that reseeds on its own and is gorgeous. Okay, next slide. I found these two genera on the specialist bee list, but there are a lot more in the mint family, and I suspect many others have specialists. Next slide. Okay, many lily flowers are pollinated by butterflies. The pollen hangs far below the nectaries. Notice how flowers signal to bees and other pollinators that they are ready for pollination. And um, I'm sorry, I, I can't use the cursor to point things out, but if you look at the flowers on the in the back, you'll see that uh, the petals are hanging down, but on sunny days, and if we had UV glasses, we'd see an even more dramatic pattern around those red dots when the petals are, are pulled um, all the way back, visually uh, yelling at bees, this way to the nectar. <laughs> so next slide, please. Rose mallow bees look an awful lot like bumblebees, but if you see bees in your rose mallow, rose of Sharon, okra, seashore mallow, or cotton that look like bumblebees, good chance they are actually rose mallow bees. You'll see the males trying to mate with any bee that shows up and looking out of flowers while they wait. And um, I had a little video clip in the next slide, which you'll, you'll see a photograph of, um, but please check online um, for the clips that I included on the previous slide. And, or you can just Google um, the bee and find some fun videos of them nesting. They shoot out little balls of clay. Um, the female will collect water to, to moisten the dry soil. And then she shoots it out with her hind legs. It's really cute. OK, thanks. Next slide. Evening primroses are really fun to watch at dusk when they open. And some of our um, evening primroses um, in the, even, even though it's called the evening primrose family, uh, things like sundrops actually bloom during the day. But if you visit them at dusk, it's really fun to watch the flowers open. And we have some really amazing large sphinx moths that visit them, as well as our specialist bee which you might look for during the day or in the evening. Next slide, please. This slide is a little deceptive because the yellow passion flowers are about the, a quarter the size of the purple ones. Even though we have two species of passion flower, specialists are only known for the little yellow one. However, <laughs> you can see in the photo, the carpenter bees fit the purple flowers perfectly. And in Mexico, where they grow passion fruit for juices and other foods, they provide carpenter bee nesting blocks. And if you haven't ever eaten uh, May Pop fruit, I highly recommend it. It's really delicious. You, you wait till the fruit is kind of dry. And um, um, it also makes a really delicious, uh, very fragrant jelly. All right, next slide. The spring beauty bee is a really easy specialist to spot because her legs are covered in pink pollen and hardly anything else is in flower. <laughs> so next slide. Jacob's ladder is another wonderful native perennial that grows well in a container. And um, it really is a, a gorgeous native. And this one you do find in, um, in almost in, in a regular nursery. So, all right, next slide. Okay, even if you don't find the specialist bee, it's worth taking a close look at pickerel weed flowers and keep a lookout for frogs while you're at it. <laughs> uh, 
These top right photos are plants in containers at Mellow Marsh Farm, a wonderful wholesale native plant nursery near Pittsburgh. Alrighty, next slide. New Jersey tea is a very small shrub that grows well even in very dry conditions and it's a great pollinator plant. And if you happen to be from out west, they have a huge diversity of um, Ceanothus, which is the genus for this family, um, including beautiful lavender and blue, blue ones. And um, here in the east, we have a buckthorn that's not native um, and it's uh, invasive, it's a little bit of a problem. But this little New Jersey tea is a wonderful plant. It tolerates uh, really dry sites and uh, supports a huge diversity of native pollinators. Okay, next slide. The rose family is one of our uh, economically most important families. Um, so much of our, because um, so much of our fruit are in the rose family, strawberries, apples, peaches, and nuts like almonds. Um, so I was curious, this Andrina is called Andrina ziziiformis, the specialist, and I looked up the meaning of ziz, wondering if it had some special meaning. Um, and it's actually a name from the Bible and apparently means blossom. And so um, notice that the scientific name Aziziaformis um, has the word for the genus Zizia, which was Golden Alexander. So I think this bee was named after the other specialist bee um, because of the Zizia. Anyway, that's probably too much information. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay, so this one, I couldn't find any um, pictures of the pollinator, uh, the specialist um, um, by itself or on the flower. So we definitely need your help capturing the specialist bees on bluets. Alrighty, next slide. Well, uh, I think a lot of us think of the really big, huge black willow trees um, when we think of the willow family, but we have some really beautiful shrub willows that um, can make really nice uh, landscape plants as well. Uh, around here, we just have two, the Carolina willow and the silky willow, but the farther north you go, um, there's a much greater diversity, and uh, you can see it's really fun to watch the bees. They get totally covered in the pollen. And um, some willow twigs are used by Native Americans for making baskets. And willows are also host for many moth and butterfly species. Okay, next slide. Most of the saxifrage family plants I know grow in woodlands, but a native plant landscaper in Greensboro, Steve Windham, uses them in containers in shade and they're gorgeous. Note that the research at Mount Cuba found that the straight species seemed to be the only kind attractive to specialist bees. So uh, they did a survey of bees at Mount Cuba um, a couple years ago and found uh, one of the uh, best populations of this very rare bee. Okay, next slide. If you've never tried ground cherry, so that's what Physalis is, it's it, the plants um, are related to tomatoes and tomatillas. They're also called wild tomatilla. Um, they're really delicious, and we have native ones as well as introduced. And if you want to grow cultivated varieties, you can get seeds from So True Seed in Asheville or Southern Exposure in Virginia. Okay, next slide. Penstemons or beard tongues are gorgeous natives with spires of pink to white flowers. They often retain an overwintering over rosette, so may help suppress weeds within a mixed planting. And I've been trying to capture a picture of the beautiful uh, mason bee, Osmia, that is a specialist, but so far I've, I've just caught some other bees on there. <laughs> Alrighty, next slide, please. Many people grow verbenas because they are so attracted to butterflies, so be on the lookout for this little calliopsis. And um, as I was um, thinking about this slide, I realized I need to include little size bars on the photos because this is a really tiny, tiny bee. <laughs> Almost all the bees we've looked at today are really tiny. So next slide. Most of us have violets in our gardens or yards, 
so just need to hunker down close to some to look for visitors. Like most of the native plants, they also host many butterflies and moths, including some rare species like Diana fritillary butterflies. So next slide. Okay, well, how can you help? And so uh, in the next section, I'll talk a little bit more about iNaturalist and some other resources. And um, so next slide. If you don't already use iNaturalist or seek by iNaturalist, I hope you'll download both today and start using them. Most states have state biodiversity groups you can join or state um, data will be vetted and added to your state's natural heritage data. So you're really contributing to a great uh, data set. And so here on the slide, I actually um, pulled up the, the Ohio Bee Atlas. And uh, this is all citizen, uh, what Xerces calls community science um, and or citizen science, it's, you can call it either one. And um, so it, people are really making a huge difference. Okay, next slide. Uh, these are some tips from the Ohio project, and um, um, it's amazing how quickly you, you get better when you start taking close-ups on your phone. So don't get discouraged if the first couple photos you take aren't clear. Um, what, what you need to do is zoom in and tap on it and wait a minute for the, the phone to refocus. And um, practice really helps, and photos don't have to be perfect to improve our understanding of habitat needs. Um, one tip I want to emphasize is when you set up iNaturalist, um, adjust the settings so you aren't automatically uploading. Um, take your photos in the field, then upload later when you have Wi-Fi. Otherwise, you can quickly run out of phone battery power. Okay, next slide. Here's the Seek by iNaturalist, and this is just for phones, whereas the iNaturalist, you can upload from your computer as well and do batch up uploads and things like that. Um, but Seek was really designed to entice young people to explore. And so um, if I could use my pointer, the, the two phones on the right show challenges and then species badges. So if you um, uh, capture a certain number of species, then you get a badge. OK, next slide. Another wonderful resource that you can help expand is Bug Guide. And Bug Guide is um, uh, if you have something that you want help IDing, it's a group of volunteers uh, that are assigned to review those particular um, species. And so this is an expert, basically, group uh, reviewing. You, there's also experts on iNaturalist, but um, the iNaturalist is an open community, so there's just a once a certain number of people agree to an identification, then it becomes verified. Whereas on Bug Guide, it's um, generally a specialist who will identify it as close as they can to species. OK, next slide. And if you're really interested in bee identification, Discover Life includes an interactive key for identifying bees. And it's the site that was linked to on the specialist bee site. Next slide. And there's lots of other great resources on Discover Life. And um, so I wanted to mention, you know, I was emphasizing plants. Um, and um, so one thing, if you are thinking about planting, besides enough flowers nearby nests for pollen and nectar, cavity nesting bees need appropriate cavities and nest building materials. So leaf gutter, leaf cutter bees also need leaves for their nests. And these tend to be certain species that have antimicrobial properties. And I listed a few up there. Uh, plants in the rose family, legumes like redbud, uh, willow, cottonwood, and things like that. OK, next slide. Here are some book recommendations. And I hope many of you got to see Joe Wilson's program yesterday. Uh, he and the co-author of Bees in Your Backyard uh, Olivia Carroll are just wonderful uh, educators and they also have an Instagram site and they post to YouTube and um, uh, but you can see his bug fest program in the uh, programs that are posted to the NC Museum of Natural Sciences uh, YouTube channel along with this one today and I um, encourage you to do that. 
And I wanted to mention that um, Bees in Your Backyard you can actually get as a Kindle book. So you can download it on your phone. <laughs> okay. And also, I forgot, um, Dr. Elsa Youngstead, and I, I think she did uh, one of the programs, maybe on Carpenter Bees, I'm not sure, um, during Bug Fest. Uh, and she and Hannah Levinson put together this nice guide for North Carolina. And that's on Amazon now. And um, you can also get it from the UNC Press. Okay, uh, next slide. More and more states have native or wild bee extension and monitoring programs that include native bee training. So Ohio State University is where I first did the specialist bee program for their uh, training group. And then Ohio State, uh, oh, um, Oregon um, also has a wonderful bee uh, extension program. And they have this uh, terrific podcast called Pollination. And today, just today, I discovered that um, Ohio has now uh, developed a, a guide to specialist bees of Ohio. So you can just Google that and find the PDF online. It has um, some really nice pictures of plants as well as the specialist bees. So next slide. Thanks again to all of you and NC Museum of Natural Sciences. Sorry for the delay in getting going today. And um, so I think we're taking questions now. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Okay, um, you did have a question in the YouTube chat um, about iNaturalists. So I, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, because I don't know off the top of my head. But um, Elise was wondering if uh, you photograph bugs in a garden with cultivated plants, does that count as also captive or cultivated, like a, a large public garden, for instance, if you go there? Yes, that's a great question. And when you upload your photos, and I find that um, even though it sounds like it'd be more convenient to upload batch upload um, on the computer, I never make the time to do that. So I'm I generally, as I'm after I've been out in the field and I'm standing waiting around for something, I'll I'll upload them one by one from my phone. And as you're uploading, one of the options is um, is it cultivated? And so you can mark it as cultivated, um, which is really helpful. Okay. And then okay. the other thing that's nice to know that's kind of related is if you are um, photographing something that you know is rare, then you can also um, obscure the location. And I think iNaturalist may automatically obscure some rare locations, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So. Yeah, I, I, that sounds familiar, so I believe that leads certain species. All right. Um, most of the other things that I'm seeing in chats are fabulous observations of, of the things. There, there's lots of talks about the the male bee sleeping in the, the flower, the geranium, and, and uh, different things like that. So yeah, there there have been wonderful observations about the different flowers. Okay. Well, I'm, I know it was kind of fast, so I, I hope you all have time to go back and, and look if you um, wanted a little more time on a particular slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Carrie was saying, I love learning about all the plants that my garden needs oh, to attract all to attract of those bees. Yeah, and the, um, the NC Pollinator Conservation Alliance, they put together a plant list, um, mainly led by the NC Botanical Garden. Um, and that's particularly for pollinators, a great list. And then the NC Bot Audubon um, has a huge set of native plants that they list. Of course, they were aiming at birds, but those are wonderful for um, bees as well. All right, fabulous. Yeah, you shared so many good resources. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I am going to share my screen now. Let me pull this up. All right. Okay, so I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Adamson, for coming to talk with us. Um, I learned, again, so many things about a lot of, again, plants that my garden needs as well to attract these native bees. And also just to, like, spend time outside and see some of these tiny bees because I, you know, sometimes notice honeybees, but I don't pay attention necessarily to the smaller, lesser known bees. Um, so thank you so much for speaking with us. And thank you all so much for tuning into this talk. We hope you found all of these different native bees and flowers interesting. We'd like to thank BASF for their sponsorship of Bug Fest this year. And as always, thank you so much to our museum members who help make events 
like uh, Bugfest possible. If you join or renew your membership during this event, you can get a free Bugfest t-shirt, which is pictured on the slide here. So um, there are other great programs scheduled for this week. So we'll post the link to our schedule with how to register for those. Um, and again, this recording will be available on our YouTube playlist and um, as well as posted to the Bugfest program page later on. Thank you all so much for attending and we hope you all have a great rest of your day.